Okay, folks, we're on our way to Dubell. It's the uh, dig site for Arizona Rainbow Petrified Wood. So this is the tundra desert area right now as we speak. Oh, now we're out of it. Okay, so I just passed through a very corner area of the national park. It's a petrified wood, uh, how do I say this? Petrified forest and it's protected. So I cannot dig in there, but the Dubell Ranch is gonna let me dig. So that's where we're uh, driving down this road to. Yeah, just general like rundown for people that uh, know a little bit of ro about rocks or don't know a lot. So like, you know, you well, drive the out here. history of the land, grandpa moved out here in 1929, bought the land. In 36, he opened a privately owned business um, over there at the little gray house over there which wasn't there until 1952. Um, opened the first privately owned business in 36, and up until 1973, he ran the business out there, and then the state came in and wanted to widen the highway, and they had to change the highway, the entrance to the park. Yeah, so now the um, highway runs out over there. Yes. And it runs past, and the uh, entrance comes in over there, into the park, and... So the, the National Park's just back there, right? Yes, right there where them horse barns are and them towers there. That is actually the National Park. The old highway runs right here in front of us. It goes right through that barn there. Okay. Up until 1973. Cool. So when he was, when you it was your granddad? My husband's grandfather. Your husband's grandfather. When he was pulling logs out, like, were they doing a lot more handwork back then they, to get them they out? They didn't really dig a whole lot back when Grandpa was doing it. It was all surface wood. We never had to dig on this land until 1975. Okay. And then we started digging out logs. Um, if you can see all the way around us, they've dug. This is our privately owned land here where we've dug. Um, over there in that hole over there by where the three big logs are, there was three trees come out of there. There was the tree that came out over here. Yeah. And we're still digging at this time. Okay. And I pr I'm pronouncing it Dobell? Dobell. Dobell Ranch? Okay. And my name is Rhonda Dobell. So you were telling me about the, the big log that came out of here and it how... It was a tree. It was yep. 35 foot long. Um, the gentleman that bought it made the longest petrified wood tabletop ever made, 14 foot long, four and a half foot wide. Um, it's down at the Tucson show. Ralph Thompson is his name. That is the front part the of the cool tree one. right there. Yeah. That's the size as it was. It was almost four and a half foot in dia uh, diameter and 35 foot long. So then you told you were telling me how they got out got it out by plastering the top. They drilled holes underneath the tree, plaster Paris the top of it, put two steel beams, came in with the crane truck and lifted it as one piece, which I've never seen done again. Most of the time you're using the excavator the here. Excavator, yes, sir. And you're just digging through till it till you feel something grab and you so go we'll down hit, with the. We, well, you'll hit something and you'll hit and it won't go through it because it's stone right then we stop and we start going in to, with shovels and seeing which way it goes and how deep it is and then we'll come in with a backhoe and dig out the sides and are you the only property that's digging uh petrified wood not necessarily like uh like you're you're the only for, one i know for, of a public for private people to come out and do yes i am okay but are there other ranches that can pull them out around here there is, there, uh, you have a uh, lease land. You lease some mineral rights around us. Mm. And uh, Jim Gray's the one that has all them, that guy down here at the... Right, with the big yeah, shop, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Expensive Man. But... <laughs> anyway, that's the other guy that digs out here. So. Yeah. He won't let, allow nobody to come out. Right. How old are the trees? 180 million to 220 million years old. That's geologically speaking. Mm -hmm. I had a gentleman from Colorado take a piece of my tree, took it back to Colorado. He analyzed it, brought it back to a sphere, brought me a sphere, and he told me that tree was 220 plus million years old. That's 
Yeah, this is one of the ones I got. Yeah, I'll take that one. I'm just not even gonna worry about it. Okay. And all these are pieces we've dug out of the holes around here. So, how many uh, people come here a week? You figure? Oh, in a week's time, probably 30, 40 people. Oh wow. Yeah, we have a lot of rock groups that come. Right, different clubs like field trips and yes. stuff? Yes. These three big pieces here you'd use to cut and make tabletops out of. Right. You can see the solidness of it. There's no fractures, major fractures anywhere in these pieces. Yeah. And that's all your calcium buildup here? Yep. This is really easy to get off. It's not real hard. The cement part here, this is a natural cement that the wood built around itself to protect it. This is a little harder to get off, but it does come off. From the water and the... No, from the water and the suet. The volcanic ash, limestone. This is our dig site. This is where you can come out and dig and find things. See, there's a few pieces down there that people dug up and just left there. Right. These are pieces. Anything you see around the hole is something that they've dug up and left. And Except for the big pieces here. We dug them up. Yep. This right here is your limestone. Okay. Yep, there's your limestone. This band this band here of the yes. white? Yes. Right? Yes. And it looks like there's multiple bands like that? Yes. So multiple limestone layers? Yes. Okay. And then iron you layers? also have volcanic ash. There's some volcanic ash in this too. Is that going to be like the black? The black. The black yeah. is yeah. going to be yeah. your volcanic The black ash. is going to... Okay. Yeah. Just a wonderful life out here. Yeah. Okay, I'm now at the uh, Rainbow Park, which is the petrified forest. This is the national park. And it may not be showing in the video, but uh, all around me is petrified wood, literally every stone you see on the hills, every little brown dot back here, over there, all of it. Petrified wood logs. Let me tell you tell you about the Colorado Plateau. Um, you look on a map, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. Arizona, where I am now, in the uh, national park, um, is all part of the Colorado Plateau. So there's a whole bunch of fossils here. Now I know this this park that I'm in is um, rainbow wood, right? Because of all the be beautiful colors of silica. But there's so many other kinds of fossils here. As you know, with Utah Dino Bone, uh, which is part of the same Colorado Plateau, uh, you can find um, clams, uh, many kinds of uh, uh, plant material. I think in this park alone, they found uh, hundreds of different kinds of plant material, right? Dinosaur skulls. So the whole park is Jurassic era, right? Um, I think uh, 223 million years ago is is the timestamp on it, but. Um, uh, I think 180 million somewhere in there as well. Um, so that's our timestamp, right? That's literally time of the dinosaurs. So all this wood uh, that you find in the park is that time era. Now the whole area, right? When back back that long ago, we had Pangaea, the whole uh, global continent kind of thing. So this whole area would have been pretty much at the equator, and it would have looked like uh, Costa Rica. Right, lush rainforest kind of style. So, you're not allowed to take anything from the park, as most national parks are. Uh, but it's pretty cool because you can roam around it here. The stars at night in this area are unbelievable. Literally, like astounding. Um, 
because the closest city, Phoenix, is so far away. Like three and a, three and a half hours, something like that. Um, it's a really big park. It doesn't span the whole Colorado Plateau, obviously, but um, it is part of it. It's very quiet, very peaceful. And if you're coming for the Petrified Wood, which I highly recommend, um, speak to Rhonda about at her ranch. Uh, very good experience. If that's not enough, Albert Einstein visited here and there's a picture of him by the logs, which makes every rock hound proud. So come check it out. All these trees were deposited from a river. So uh, as they died, the limbs would fall off and the, um, the leaves and they, the banks underneath them would erode around the river. The river would carry them away. They'd get covered in sediment in various ways. And uh, they gradually got preserved from the fossilization process. And more and more layers of earth stacked on top but then eventually eroded away. So even though it looks like a river ran it through here, that's not the river that carried the trees. That's more recent erosion that has eroded for those further layers away that piled on top. What was left behind uh, was the fossilized wood. The logs being covered in the earth would eventually break through uh, various kinds of tectonic shifts and uh, land adjustments. Again, remember all these logs fell down into the earth back when uh, Arizona would have been close to the equator. So for a couple hundred million years as Pangaea spread apart and became the continents it was, they were moving and shifting with those tectonic plates and breaking. Sometimes in the pieces of wood you'll see knots. It's pretty rare to find the knots in the petrified wood. Uh, you can also find limbs on the sides of the wood, so as the tree gets crushed, the limb will almost laminate against the wood as part of the fossil, so you can actually find them with tree branches. And uh, as you can say, see, you get some pretty long pieces. So, this is cool because in high school, when we were taught geological timelines. We were looking at leaf prints that we weren't sure were uh, boot prints. We, you know, most of the times the teacher would point at something in, in the shale sheets and we just nod our heads and agree that it kind of looked like 1 16th of a dragonfly wing. But this is where you can actually see the big log chunks and they've tumbled down here too. There's another one up there. So this is the line that those logs are in. And as you can see, it's all around me here. So even the bright yellows created by the iron oxides are visible in the quartz. You can tell by the cleavage uh, that it's definitely quartz by the conchoidal fractures and just the sugary texture where there's been some some sort of traumatic event to it. Pretty cool rock, but I'm not allowed to take it because right now we are in the park, so I will go pay for that at a private dig site known as Dubell Ranch. So, how does the fossilization process occur? Uh, I get asked that a lot. When a tree falls, it's got to be covered by earth quickly so that it doesn't decay, right? Bugs are going to eat it, bacteria is going to eat it, everything wants to break it apart. But if we can seal it away from oxygen, bacteria and bugs cannot thrive. Um, they essentially starve, or suffocate, sorry, and uh, the anaerobic activity ceases. So now you've got this uh, tree, or any kind of life form that has any kind of carbon form, I should say, um, that has been locked up in the earth. 
what locks it up would be things like uh, flash floods, um, landslides, uh, desert storms. Um, one of the main reasons there's so many sea fossils is because of the seafloor sediment swishing back and forth on top of it. Uh, again, as in the case with these trees, uh, it was uh, the river silt that poured over top of it and kept um, uh, covering them. So that's all fine and dandy, but then what turns it to stone, right? So those are the conditions that it needs. It needs to uh, um, be in an oxygen depleted environment, 100% oxygen depleted. And then uh, what turns it to stone is uh, fossilization, which is a mineralization process. So we'll take these pieces of wood, for example, they fall into the earth and they're still, I would say wood at that point, so they can soak up uh, water around them, and that's what they do. And with that water, kind of like think of capillary action, not through the roots, but just generally into the wood, uh, silica goes in there with it. So silica, rich water, um, seeps in, and it's different than cavities in the earth that make agates or geodes. Um, but any, any kind of organic matter, or fossil or bone or whatever, it'll soak that up. And then... Um, the quartz that was in the water will start growing into crystal, right? So when you've got agates or jasper, which is this wood, or even opalized wood, those are all in the quartzite family, which are microcrystalline silicas. So uh, if you've ever put sugar in a glass with, um, with string, you'll see the crystals grow on the string. So same thing when the crystals are uh, when you get a seed crystal inside the piece of wood it's going to start transforming and the softest areas of the wood are going to transform first and as the transformation continues and some of the softer areas have started turning to stone the harder areas will begin to turn turn to stone as well till eventually the whole thing is turned to stone when something has fossilized it is the same as petrified it's um, and it's a rock at that point. The only thing that is usually not is amber. True amber is fossilized, but there's something called uh, copal, which is partially far fossilized amber. And uh, amber is tree sap. So that's why, you know, the whole idea of bugs being a bugs flying get caught in the tree sap. So if it's partially fossilized, then it's not true amber and it's very difficult to work as lapidary. However, the agatized or jasperized quartzites. Those are all just fancy words for the quartzite family um, that narrow it down more. Uh, but the agatized woods are very easy to work and quite beautiful. Why does some of the rainbow wood have colors? Uh, because if quartz is leaking in, shouldn't they all be white? They start white. Well, they don't start white, sorry. Um, Actually, they kind of do. So the quartz farms, and then there are impurities in the quartz. So this happens with all fossils. This is why they all get their colors. Is the impurities in the quartz, like manganese oxides, will start turning um, different kinds of like blacks and, uh, and grays, even some browns. The um, the iron oxides will turn the reds, purples, uh, the yellows. So those impurities within it will gradually um, oxidize over time, giving the quartz its color, and so the colors of the quartz take even longer. Uh, I do want to clarify too when I said that uh, the organic material, when it's uh, covered in sediment, will soak up the water and the minerals in the earth around it, um, such as the irons and the manganese and all kinds of, you know, you get um, green, green ones as well, uh, and that would be like copper oxides. So, um, it's not like the day it falls. It could be a uh, geological time frame as that organic material soaks it up. Again, the softest, more vulnerable areas will soak up uh, water uh, more readily and easily, and, and the rest of the uh, silica-rich waters will take quite a bit longer to percolate into the uh, denser, harder-to-reach places.